I'm Paul Blowers. I am the uh, professor of church history here at Emmanuel. As my kids say when they call me on the phone, hello, Dean E. Walker, professor of church history. <laughs> uh, smart aleck kids. I've known Doug Foster longer than he would want to admit. Uh, we have been dear friends for a, a, about 20 years, I think, and uh, have worked together on various projects. Um, uh, most importantly, the Encyclopedia of the Stone Campbell Movement that came out in 2004, 2005. Uh, we have been working together most recently on um, the World History of the Stone Campbell Movement project, which is going to be uh, turned into the publishers hopefully soon. It's being the manuscript is being uh, uh, edited right now, and he is very much engaged in that work. And then also we've uh, worked together in the Stone Campbell Dialogue, which actually met in this room the last couple of days and uh, has been a wonderful forum to bring together people from the three streams of the Stone Campbell movement to uh, discuss issues that, that affect us all and to work toward the ministry of reconciliation among the churches. Doug is a graduate of Lipscomb University and Skerritt College in Nashville when Skerritt was still a... Uh, degree granting institution and then he did his doctoral studies uh, in American religious history at Vanderbilt University. He's taught um, at Lipscomb, he's taught for several years now as uh, the senior professor of church history in the uh, College of Biblical Studies and Theology at uh, Abilene Christian University. He is uh, probably, I think he's the most recognizable historian of Stone Campbell studies in the United States right now. Uh, he travels the world uh, teaching uh, in various institutions of the Churches of Christ, and he, uh, he has been to Emmanuel more than once and graced our campus. Uh, he is a, uh, a great spokesman for what the Stone Campbell movement aspires yet to be. Uh, so you're in, you're in for a real treat today. So I welcome Dr. Doug Foster. Well, part of the reason that I was so excited to be able to do this is to be able to stay an extra day from the Stone Campbell movement and visit with my good friend Paul and his wife Sandy. But there were also other wonderful things that happened. I got to, uh, to have lunch today with Leonard Wymore. And I've gotten to greet and see several folks that I know and love for a long time. In fact, Doug Lawson. Notice Doug Lawson. A couple of summers ago, there were four people that spoke at the Oregon Christian Convention. Doug Foster, Doug Priest, a Doug, a, 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 a disciple from Dallas, Fort Worth area, and Leroy. And so after the second day, we inducted him into the Honorary Doug Society. <laughs> Since everybody else was a Doug. <laughs> so to get to see Doug uh, Lawson was a great treat as well. And several, several of you, uh, that I've known and, and loved and, and so pleased to be able to be here. Thank you for letting me come. I'd like for you to do something. You got, everybody got a piece of paper and pencil, right? Everybody should have picked something up when you came in, a couple of handouts. Uh, there should be one that kind of is an outline of my presentation as far as the content of it in a few minutes. But there should have been a couple of other handouts, the Declaration, 13 propositions of the Declaration and Address, and then a restating of the Declaration. Whatever you have, if it's this blank paper or one of those pieces of paper that you can find a little space on, white space, I want you to do a little exercise, all right? 60 seconds. I'm going to give you 60 seconds, and you know how this works. It's one of those um, psychological things, you know? For 60 seconds, write as fast as you can every word or phrase that comes to your mind when I say the words, the restoration movement. Go. Okay, stop. 60 seconds is quite a long time, but it's not a, enough maybe for everyone. But you've written something down. Now, in groups of two or three, Tell what you wrote in groups of two or three maximum. Tell each other what you wrote down. <laughs> if you need to turn around to somebody behind you, do that. Uh, 
you've been excluded. Join, join those, those two wonderful Christians. Hey, Bruce. Wow, you got a lot. Can we do it in Portuguese? Sure, absolutely. Ah, you're sitting together, no fair. <laughs> Brother Blowers. Now, once you have actually heard the words or phrases, <coughs> once you've actually heard the words or phrases from your partner or partners, I'd like for you to, to talk just for about 60 seconds with each other about what you heard. What did you hear that was positive? What did you hear that was negative or maybe had an, a negative undertone? What did you hear that was sort of neutral? It could go either way. Okay, talk to each other just for a few minutes, uh, just about another 60 seconds actually. What did you hear from each other? Positive, negative, undertones? How do you feel about these things? Was this just some sort of, this is not just an intellectual academic exercise. Talk about something that's, that's grabbing you about these things. Okay, go. Okay, let's come back together as a group of the whole. It's very interesting to watch the dynamics. Uh, some people uh, animatedly engaged in conversation, smiling, laughing, others sitting, scowling, <laughs> <laughs> saying nothing. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is to have, let me say three hands of people who will tell this group one thing that you heard from the conversation with your partner a word or phrase and maybe something that's attached to it as far as uh, negative, positive, emotional. Three hands. One. Can we volunteer somebody else? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can tell what somebody else said, but you can't volunteer anybody else. So we've got number one, we've got to have two more hands. Number two, thank you. And number three, one more hand. Got all afternoon. Thank you. Number three. And number four in the back. We'll have four quickly. Tell, tell your word or phrase and a little bit of what's the, what's the meaning, what's the content. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we're silent. Okay. Where would you put that? Positive. <laughs> <laughs> Half of it's positive. Half of it's negative. Well, yeah, it, it phrased. Thank Not really. you. Really? There's times to be silent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> Uh, okay, and uh, who was number two? Who was number two? Number two? Um, the, search, the idea that conservative churches invented the phrase restoration movement. Okay, uh, by conservative churches, do you mean independent Christian churches or just conservative generally? Okay. And, and so the, uh, the idea that this is unique to only conservatives, or that they... That the, restoration, that the restoration movement is, you know, that, that's the best, that's what we are supposed to do. That's the terminology that's, that's most the terminology powerful. We use. Okay, so in response to the restoration not, movement. Not proper. Oh. It's not true. <laughs> Okay, tell me where that's going to go up here. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to unpack that later. Okay, number three. Yes. Um, the primitivist impulse, uh, the idealistic New Testament pattern maybe or something like that. Okay, pattern, primitivism. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
I personally said it doesn't adequately account for human sin. It's almost pie in the sky. So I said that that was kind of negative. Okay. Uh, sense. Well, I mean, that's what you that's what you said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're recognizing that not all would take that same position, but right, that's what right, you, yeah, that was your sort of sure, sense. Sure. Uh, what was the other term, primitivism? Um, idealistic New Testament pattern. Okay, patternism is another term that's often used, okay. And what, what about in the corner over here? Um, unity. I think we said that there's a kind of a look to see just uh, kind of a movement of unity, a unity movement. Positive. But also, that can go to negative in that it's uh, not a lot of times seen. Or sometimes it gets obscured, perhaps, or sometimes it gets, you know, none of these words has only one definition or understanding, right? These words get used quite often as if everybody understands them precisely the same way. And that's not the case. So we have to be careful on how we use them, right? And we have to be very precise in, in using them. Anybody else? I had four. Would you like one that goes in the middle? Sure. Well, th this is what uh, D Doug. was goading me. Doug. Uh, we have, from the very beginning of our movement, uh, we have sought to, to do two things. Uh, we have had allegiance to two principles, and one of them was uh, the, being biblical and the others being ecumenical. Mm, uh, mm. And those, those have been held in tension from the beginning and they have been played out in various... Uh, in, in, you said there have been times when uh, some of our churches have been so biblical that their hermeneutic has gotten so narrow that it, the circle comes down to a point and they fellowship with no one else. Uh, on the left, that happens on the right, on the left, the ecumenical principle is stressed to the point where the faith is down to the lowest common denominator. And you can fellowship with anybody and everybody because you're not going to really believing anything. And so we constantly struggle with how biblical are you and how ecumenical are you. Mm. And where, how do you define that in such terms? that your circle is broad enough, but it is a circle that defines something yes. that has content. Yeah, okay. Very good. Uh, anybody else? One more person. Something that was strongly felt, strongly thought, strongly said, strongly written in your group. Anybody? Division. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's strong. Division. I'm assuming that you put that over. No, I like it. <laughs> I'll put it wherever you want. Like. <laughs> there certainly has been a lot of division in the restoration movement, as we call it, as a historical movement. Uh, and uh, okay, all right, very interesting, very interesting. The the topic that John gave me, uh, and this was John's, not mine, although I think it's a good one. What would I want every restoration movement minister or leader to know for today about the Stone Campbell movement? Well, I immediately thought of some things that I thought were most important and also understanding, and somebody broke the clock in the room, so I'm going to take my, uh, John's going to help me too, but I'll, I will watch my clock. We have three hours, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> A nervous laughter. <laughs> Just, it just seemed like three hours, that's true. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I began to think in terms of what would I say, what would I say if I were to try to define a, maybe I should say it, an ideal, uh, a theological concept, a focus that makes this movement that many historians today are calling the Stone Campbell movement because there are quite a number of other restoration movements you know that are out there historically when you say the restoration movement unless you're in our little circles nobody knows precisely what you're talking about so what is it that makes the Stone Campbell movement the Stone Campbell movement what is it well 
I, I asked you to sort of what words flow when you have a minute, when you've got 60 seconds, what words flow from your mind, your heart, your experience, your knowledge. Uh, I'm sure there are other words that would be out there if I, we would just run around the room and had everybody say some. But some of the same words, some of the same ideals, some of the same foci that I thought of obviously came out here. The problem, of course, is, and even our, even our discussion so far has reflected the fact that we don't understand many of these terms precisely the same way. So what I'd like to do is to tell you what they all really mean. <laughs> OK? Now, I'll, I'll tell you what I think from my study. And Paul Blowers uh, will back me up 100% right on anything I say. Huh? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> Um, what I think that I would say are the heart of the Restoration Movement, the heart of the Stone Campbell Movement. And so here, here are my answers in this sort of refocus, this restated content to, the, to our uh, session this afternoon. And if you have the handout, it, I think will show that I have focused on three areas of relationships. A right relationship with God, a right relationship with all who are trying to follow Christ, and a right relationship with those who do not yet know or accept Christ. Those are the three areas. And if you want to use the terms restoration, unity, and mission, which we will eventually, we, you, you can but I think what I'm talking about are these three desires, these three deeply held commitments that the people in this Stone Campbell movement had. And as they struggled in their own context, in their own day, in 19th century America, as this particular historical manifestation of Christ's church, this reform effort comes into existence, they're reflecting all of those contexts. They're reflect, reflecting an American context, a Western conflict, uh, context, a, uh, a certain kind of intellectual context, a certain kind of religious context. They're reflecting all of those things, whether they know it or not, or admit it or not, or like it or not, they are. And so first of all, the thing that I would like all ministers and leaders and members and people in this movement to know about this Stone Campbell movement today, is that one of those deep desires and commitments to, was to have a right relationship with God. Another way of saying it is the desire to know God and to be conformed to God's will. Uh, for short, I would label that restoration. Now, restoration is always contextual. Uh, several years ago, I did a, an article about all the different restoration movements that were in the world right now, not even counting throughout history. A number of years ago, a book was written on the restoration idea, and you can see it coming up throughout church history. But every con every, in every context that this idea comes up, it reflects what's going on there then at that time. And the same thing is true about us. That doesn't make us bad. It just makes us human beings. It doesn't make us trying to deceive anyone. Sometimes we deceive ourselves, but it just means we are like all other human beings. We are not exempt from the same things that all other human beings experience. We don't exist floating above the ground at some level and somehow exempt from those influences. And so they're always contextual. Again, whether we know it or like it or admit it or not. And so we have this Western, this American, uh, this intellectual set of context that we come out of as far as our restoration movement, the Stone Campbell restoration movement. Now, some of you already know, and this is going to be an overview, obviously, and we will have some question and answer time, and uh, either Paul or John will be glad to answer any questions you have uh, about this topic, or uh, I'll, I'll, I will have to leave about that time. But the, um, the intellectual climate in America in the early 19th century was heavily influenced by certain kinds of rationalistic assumptions. Not everybody bought into it. Not everybody knew about it. But there was, even at the level of uh, popular understanding, even people who had not studied philosophy or even gone to school very much, there were a, a number of assumptions that people had 
about reality. And again, without trying to make some universal claim that everybody bought this in the same way or at the same level, human intellect was primary. Human intellect. We have the ability, the God-given ability and the God-given responsibility to figure out things. Now, at one level, in the intellectual, uh, in the Enlightenment, there were certain kinds of intellectual assumptions that only the gifted folks could do this. Only the natural aristocrats. Only the folks that God had given the special knowledge to do these kinds of things. You could figure out anything that you wanted to. It doesn't make any difference what it is. If it's in biology, if it's in um, chemistry, if it's in politics, it doesn't make any difference. If you use your intellectual abilities and do what we might call it research in some cases, experimentation in other cases, the scientific method becomes the, the model. You know, you have a hypothesis. You learned this in the seventh grade, right? Seventh grade biology is where I learned it. You have a hypothesis, you do experiments and you test it, and then the results of that make you revise the hypothesis, and then you do more testing, and so forth and so on, until eventually, through this very rigorous, ponderous process, you will arrive at the truth. The laws of nature. Nature is everything. When I say nature, at least when I used to say nature, I meant rocks and trees and birds and flowers and things like this. Nature means, to those folks, everything, the universe. And there are certain laws that run the universe, and you can discover those laws. Now, where do you go if you're in biology to discover the laws? Well, you go to plants. Gre Gregor Mendel does all the experimentation and comes up with hybrid plants that are more uh, productive. And you can uh, do experimentation to find plant ver ver uh, varieties that are more resistant to certain kinds of blood. You just keep doing the experiments until you find the truth in that. You can find it in any area. The folks who designed our US Constitution believe this. Well, how do you get the data on that? You don't just go out and form a few governments and see which one works. You look at history. You look at history. If you go back and look at the notes from the Constitutional Convention, so-called, you'll find that they're talking about what happened in the Greek republics. And, the ancient governments. And they look at that and they believe that they had pulled together the perfect government. They had found the truth, the law of nature that dealt with that. Well, where do you go for religious truth? You go to the Bible. And so, you approach the Bible using a rigorous intellectual process and you find the truth. Now, there are good parts and bad parts to that. But let me just say, in our own history, Alexander Campbell was the person who emphasized more than any of the other early leaders, I think. At least he was the one that had the most exposure. This very optimistic view that humans were going to be able intellectually to ferret out the truths of religion in the Bible through their intellectual activity. He's very optimistic. He has a very high view of human intellectual ability. And I think that, again, without trying to, to, to make too strong a statement, because I'm going to modify some things about Campbell in just a few minutes, the, um, this optimism about finding the truth, restoring the ancient gospel and order of things, this is, Campbell's, this is Campbell's program, this is Campbell's hope, because Campbell sees this as the only basis for, the only possibility for creating the unity that he believes should come among Christians. And so it was going to be a process that was primarily intellectual, primarily approaching the scriptures with this optimistic view of uh, arriving at, quote, in every other area of the laws of nature, here the truths of scripture. Now, you tell me, what's good about this understanding? There are several things that are good about this understanding. What, what, tell me, what are some good things about this understanding? Why don't you just turn to each other in your two or three groups. I'm going to give you another minute. That, that'll get you started talking, okay? Just turn to each other. What's good about this? Come on. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Now we're going to get to bad to the bad parts in a minute. Don't talk about the bad parts yet. Just the good parts. Okay, stop. Let me see four hands of people who will tell me one good thing about this understanding that you heard from your partner or partners. Not what you said, but what your partner or partner says. Four hands, quick. Four hands. One. I need four hands. People who have not yet raised their hand. We've got all afternoon. Two, thank you. Number two. Remember your number. Number three. I need another volunteer. Come on, you talked, you said something. Number three, thank you, Heather. And number four, no other officials of the university or seminary may raise their hands. <laughs> thank you. Number four, number one. Okay. It, uh, it's objective uh, over the subjective uh, revivalism uh, that uh, affected even some of the other restoration movements of the 19th century. Okay, all right, good. Number two, yes. If you're in a, in a culture that is thinking intellectually, you better uh, bring some intellect to your faith as well. Yeah, I mean, God gave us our intellectual ability, right? This is a seminary. I am a professor of church history. If I didn't believe that God gave us the gift of intellect, I would not be doing this. Okay, so this is a, this is a piece of of God's gifts, and particularly in a culture that emphasizes that. Good. Number th three, Heather. That actions result in natural consequences, and if you pursue something far enough, for instance, it can lead you to a kidney transplant. Something as obvious as um, reducing the way that the body works and nature works in the body. Okay. So, sure. So in the larger context, not just in religion, you're going to find things that are going to help humanity. There's going to be, I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful for that attitude in medicine. My wife had breast cancer. I am so grateful for that attitude in medicine to define and, and, and discover things that are there and be able to, to, uh, to help in those ways. And then number four, yes. You just said that it levels the playing field. It makes the assumption that we can all kind of, there's this universal truth we use our logic that uh, we can all, using logic, arrive at kind of this truth where we can unify them. Okay, all right. Uh, here's what I said. Nobody said what I said. <laughs> Nobody was thinking what I was thinking. I said uh, there are several good things. It, it, it's serious about knowing God's will, right? There's a seriousness. I, I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to be rigorous. There is, uh, it promotes Bible study. Did somebody say that? Good, good. You were thinking like me. It promotes conscientious attempts to understand and follow Scripture. Okay, so there, there are quite a number of, of positive things here. Now, what's dangerous about this in understanding? What's dangerous about the understanding that it is our intellectual ability that is the primary operative thing in religion and getting religion right. Let me have four hands on that one. Uh, well, my goodness. I'm getting all kinds of, I'm getting all hands, kinds of hands on the negative. Nobody would do the positive. <laughs> okay, come up, have them up come again. Number one, let me get all four. Number two, number three, one more hand. Number four, thank you. I see mine is kind of a transition. Oh. Uh, sort of answering your, your previous question. Um, it, it assumes there's it's the, the assumption that truth is, is available from the scriptures and that we can attain it um, through intellectual um, endeavors. Okay. Um, and that there's a, there's a prohibitive there also that we, we definitely, you know, we should become fixed upon that only. Mm. Say our truth is the truth. Okay. In other words, uh, there's a, a, an element of, of humility that is absent, perhaps, yes. in that attitude. Okay, good. Well, number two. Uh, the inordinate desire to elevate the opinion to make it law in the gospel. That's a problem. Yeah. 
And that's one of those uh, things that our movement has talked a lot about. In fact, we were opposed to that. Uh, that whole idea of elevating my understandings to universal, uh, the final word, universal truth, is a, is a, in, is a difficult. He was number three, yes. Right relationship is far more than objectivity and reason. Mm. And what's the point of Christianity? Relationship. <laughs> Do you see my three points on this, <laughs> on this outline this afternoon? Uh, y yes, you got that. And who was number four? Yes. Okay, a focus on, okay, and I think you're all hitting this time pretty close to what I was thinking. Focus on human intellectual ability, on a human intellectual prowess to figure everything out and get everything right. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. When I say right and I do it like this with the little quotation marks, I want to be right. But I'm not sure exactly... I'm not sure that that term is understood as the Bible uses it. Right is not intellectually, you have all the stuff straight, you, you have doctrinal precision on every item. That's not what the Bible uses for right. It means a relationship that has been made right with God, a right relationship. So I want to be right. And that's not to say that those other kinds of things are not part of that, but, but the focus on the human intellectual ability to figure out everything and get it right, well, let's just face it. The human intellect is not perfect. That does not let us off the hook, all right? It does not let us off the hook for doing rigorous intellectual activity. Those who are gifted, especially many of, uh, I suppose everybody in this room would have of that kind of gift. And as James said, it's too late for you. You can't go back. You can't neglect this. You'll be held doubly responsible, right? But the human intellect is not perfect. And the human intellect is not the end. And here's what happens. It does not always happen. I don't guess. But I don't know of any cases that it doesn't. If you know of any cases, you tell me. Because that attitude, there is a massive, massive temptation toward arrogance and pride. Can anybody quote 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 10, 12? 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Don't look it up on your iPhone. <laughs> well, it's one of my favorite verses. Paul has given the Corinthian church a history lesson. This is 1 Corinthians 10, right? He's, he's taken them through the wilderness and how God has dealt with folks. And he talks about the fact that these things were written down for our instruction. And he's given them a history lesson. On and on and on. 11 verses. Pretty straight. And then he hits verse 12. And I, I memorized it when I was in elementary school in the King James Version. So it always starts, Therefore... If you think you are standing, watch out. Paul says, arrogance, pride, and he's not the only one who says it. This comes through in many scriptures. Is the attitude that is most dangerous, most potentially destructive, most against God's very nature. It is the position that puts you in most dangerous ground. If you think you are standing, watch out. King James says, take heed. Watch out, lest you fall. And so there's a tremendous temptation toward that. Now, here's the thing. Uh, even Alexander Campbell is not... When, when pushed, he knew that that was the case. Alexander Campbell was brilliant. He, he, was, uh, he had a, uh, as one person said, a very robust ego. Some people would say he was arrogant. Uh, and sometimes he seems to be. I'm writing a biography of Campbell now for Erdman's and... Uh, 
I've come across some kind of disappointing things in the archives because I think he's a brilliant man and I think his heart's good and he's no, I'm no better than, than him as far as perfection, that's for sure. But, um, but Campbell really does sow the seeds for this focus on intellectual getting things right as the, as the key. And I think that most of us know the fact that there was another stream in our own movement that took a very different position on this. The bottom line for this other stream in our movement was not intellectual precision of facts, of doctrine, of data. That was not the bottom line. Barton Stone was serious about Bible study. Barton Stone did not take the attitude, oh, it doesn't make any difference what you believe. You believe what you want to, and I'll believe what I want to. He did not take that attitude. But he was absolutely clear about what was the bottom line, what was the point of all of this. And that was transformation into the likeness of Christ. And so I think Barton Stone would say something like this. We need to be constantly in the, in the Bible, constantly in the Word of God. Not so we can master Scripture, but so the Scripture can master us. So that God's Spirit somehow, in that mysterious way, is shaping us. And study or doctrine is not so we can beat somebody in a debate or make others rave about how much we know or say, boy, Bob Wetzel, he's sound. That's not the point. The point is to transform us more into the likeness of Christ. And if you see someone who can say all the right words... And instead of the fruit of the Spirit, they reflect the work of the flesh. They are not sound. But the dominant strain has been the intellectual focus, which has a powerful temptation to arrogance and exclusivity. And so, restoration. Restoration is not our work. It is the work of God, and it's already been accomplished by Christ. Our part is to submit to Christ's Spirit in us and to be transformed into His likeness. That's restoration. And at least some of our folks have seen that. Second place at the heart of this movement is the desire to be in a re right relationship with all who are trying to follow Christ. Unity. It's there from the very beginning. It's all the way through. If you've got the handout that's the uh, 13 propositions, not the restating or the new, re new 13 propositions, but just the 13 propositions of the Declaration and Address, if you've got that handout, just take a look at it briefly. The 13 propositions of the Declaration and Address, 1809. How many of you have read this before? How many of you have memorized large sections of it? <laughs> I, I, keep your hand up. Uh, well, you know, it's part of our history, our, our heritage. It's whether we know it or not, part of how we've been shaped. And... It has some brilliant parts to it. It's a, it's a 19th century document. It's written, if you look at the whole Declaration and Address, which is in some printings 90 pages long, there's some pretty hard to get through sections. I mean, this is 19th century prose. They don't talk like we talk today, okay? And I understand that. This 13 propositions was sort of an a encapsulation of some of the, the key commitments, the key ideas of this document. Uh, but there are brilliant pieces all the way through. Look at the first one. This is the one that's probably most quoted, maybe beside Proposition 9. The Church of Christ upon Earth. One time I was doing a seminar with a group of folks from Churches of Christ, and I, I had them read the propositions, and they said, what jumped out at you? And they said, well, for the first time they're using Church of Christ. Well, I said, no. This is familiar terminology to Presbyterians. Presbyterians are Puritans. In the 1500s, 
you look through all of the documents, they're, they're using the term Church of Christ. It just means Christ's church, Christ's body, okay? It doesn't mean a specific piece or a specific group. The Church of Christ upon earth is in its essence, in its very intentionality, and in its makeup, in its constitution, one. And it consists of everybody in every place that professes their faith in Christ and obedience to him in all things according to the scripture. Okay, they say they're Christians. And that manifest the same by their tempers and conduct. They act like it. Okay? Two criteria. You say you are. I guess if you say you're not, you're not. I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying if you say, no, I'm not a Christian. I deny being a Christ. Christian, you'd say, okay, I accept that. But you say you are. But you've you got to show that you are by the way that you live in the, this old language in your tempers and conduct. And that although the church of Christ, number two, upon earth must necessarily exist in particular and distinct societies locally separate from one another, that just means everybody in the whole wide world as a Christian can't meet the same place on Sunday morning. Okay, that's all it means. Yet there ought to be no schisms, no divisions, no uncharitable divisions among them. They ought to receive each other as Christ Jesus has received them. Now, later on in the document, he would say, if Christ received us like we receive each other, then woe be unto us. Number six. Oh, that one, we won't do that one. Inferences and deductions from Scripture. <laughs> Did you ever use that? When I, when I was growing up in churches of Christ, what are the things that are binding? Command, example. Ah, there's another Church of Christer. I'm not proud about it. I know, I know. We all were indoctrinated at that, uh, at that, you know, and certainly we're not going to ignore commands. I mean, good grief, no. But if that's the only thing that's relevant, then you might as well throw out the Psalms. And again, the Old Testament for that matter. Uh, and a good bit of the narrative of, of the New Testament as well, the Gospels, uh, may have a few commands here and there, but command, example, necessary inference. And of course, you explain away most of the examples, right? You don't do the holy kiss. <laughs> you don't do the foot washing. You know, that's, that's all cultural. You, you can explain away the, those things. But um, from the very beginning... Uh, he's saying, no, no, no deduction or inference can ever be required. It may be true. It may be true, but it's based on human reason, and therefore it cannot be required for anybody else for you to admit to receive them as a, as a Christian. And then the one, of course, the uh, nine is the one that I guess second is the second most quoted. Uh, All who are enabled through grace to make such a profession... In number eight, it talks about the profession of faith in Christ, the same thing he says in number one. And to manifest the reality of it in their tempers and conduct, so he's re redoing number one, should consider each other as the precious saints of God, should love each other as brethren, children of the same father, family and father, temples of the same spirit, members of the same body, subjects of the same grace, objects of the same divine love, bought with the same price, and joint heirs of the same inheritance, whom God hath thus joined together, no man should dare to put asunder. Straight out of the marriage vows. And then 10. Divisions. Division among Christians is a horrid evil filled with many evils. It's anti-Christian. Destroys the visible unity of the body of Christ as if he were divided against himself, excluding and excommunicating a part of himself. It's anti-scriptural. Strictly prohibited by his sovereign authority. It's anti-natural. It excites Christians to condemn, hate, and oppose one another who are bound by the highest and most endearing obligations to love each other as brethren, even as Christ has loved them. This is from the very beginning. This is from the very beginning. It's not the first of our documents. The first of our documents is the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. We have that uh, phrase, we will, the Springfield Presbytery had pulled away from the Presbyterian Church USA, the Synod of Kentucky, formed its own separate Presbyterian Church. It was growing. It was doing great. They weren't dying so that they thought, well, we're gonna, we'll just shut the thing down. They were growing. But they write this document and they say, we will no longer allow names and statements of belief to keep us from full 
embracing of all other followers of Christ. As imperfect as they are, as an imperfect as we are. We will that this body die, be dissolved, and sink into union with the body of Christ at large because there is but one body. Yeah. And we will that preachers and people pray more and dispute less. <laughs> and we heartily unite with our brethren of every name in carrying the gospel of God to this western country, he called it. Barton Stone uh, said this. It's, al it's almost, it's just astounding to me, as, as powerful as this statement, or I believe it is anyway. It, it's, it looks like a filler. You know what a filler is? Anybody who's done any editing of a newspaper, in the old days at least, uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to stop and change tapes and so I will read the Barton Stone quote when I am given the signal. 1835, Christian Messenger. He had to fill a part of a page, it looks like. So he stuck this paragraph in. It's, this is the whole thing. There's no other part of this article. This is it. The scriptures will never keep together in union and fellowship members not in the spirit of the scriptures, which is love, peace, unity, forbearance, and cheerful obedience. This is the spirit of the great head of the body. I blush for my fellows who hold up the Bible as the bond of union, yet make their opinions of it tests of fellowship, who plead for union of all Christians, yet refuse fellowship with such as dissent from their notions." Vain men, their zeal is not according to knowledge, nor is their spirit that of Christ. There is a day not far ahead that will declare it. Such anti-sectarian sectarians are doing more mischief to the cause and advancement of truth, the unity of Christians, and the salvation of the world than all the skeptics in the world. In fact, they create skeptics. You've probably heard of the so-called Lunenburg letter articles that Alexander Campbell wrote in response to a woman who supposedly was surprised that he had talked about Christians and other religious groups. And she says, you know, how do you know if one is a Christian other than that they've obeyed his commandments, and especially in baptism? How do I know that one loves my master but by his obedience to his commandments? I answer, in no other way. But Mark, I do not substitute obedience to one commandment for universal or even for general obedience. And should I see a sectarian Baptist or a pedo-Baptist more spiritually minded, more generally conformed to the requisitions of the Messiah than one who precisely acquiesces with, acquiesces with me, in the theory or practice of immersion as I teach. Doubtless the former rather than the latter would have my cordial approbation and love as a Christian. So I judge and so I feel. It is the image of Christ the Christian looks for and loves. And this does not consist in being exact in a few items, but in general devotion to the whole truth as far as known. That's Alexander Campbell, Millennial Harbinger, 1837. And then there's another quote. Uh, this man lived during the time of the division of the movement, of the Stone Campbell movement, the first division that would produce churches of Christ and Christian churches, disciples of Christ. T.B. Larimore. How many have heard of T.B. Larimore? Theophilus Brown Larimore. Several have. Well, he was being pushed very hard to take a position on all the issues. The issues. Instrumental music, missionary societies, etc., etc. In 1897, 1897, he was approached, I guess you'd say. What happened was a, a former student of his wrote an open letter to T.B. Larimore that was published in the Christian Standard. First time T.B. Larimore saw it was when he got the standard sitting on his front porch when the mailman came, okay? 
that never happens these days, but in, in those days, you know, suddenly, open letter to T.B. Larimore, pushing him, you've got to take a stand, Brother Larimore. Everybody loves you, everybody knows you, everybody respects you. What's your position? This is 1897. He says, I have been all over the country. I've not been sitting in a room. When, when he would go to do a, what we called gospel meeting, he preached three times every Sunday and twice every weekday. The longest one was in uh, North Texas. He went from January 1 to June the 17th. Three times every Sunday, twice every weekday. Baptized over 300 people. <laughs> no, Texas. <laughs> but, but here's what he said in one paragraph in his response to this open letter. Brother Larimore, take a stand. The Campbell that he's referring to here is Enos Campbell, who was a leader of the church in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. When Brother Campbell took my confession on my 21st birthday, he questioned me relative to none of these matters now retarding the pro pro progress of the cause of Christ. He's quoting from the open letter. When thousands have stood before me, hand in mine, and made the good confession, I have never questioned one of them about these matters. Can you imagine? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe in instrumental music? <laughs> Shall I now renounce and disfellowship all of those who do not understand these things exactly, exactly as I understand them? The guy was conservative, folks. T.B. Larimore was a conservative. He ended up, when things got sorted out, People knew him in all the streams, but he was most closely associated with churches of Christ. A cappella, churches of Christ. Okay? But he says, Shall I renounce and disfellowship all those who do not understand these things exactly as I understand them? They may refuse to recognize or fellowship or affiliate with me, but I will never refuse to recognize or fellowship or affiliate with them. Never. Christian evangelist. July 1897. This attitude is not the attitude that people who succumb to the temptation of arrogance that we've already talked about in that first piece would manifest. Did T.B. Larimore have convictions? He did. He just said, the issues, the issues... Take a stand on the issues, Brother Larimore. And he said it. He was not being facetious. I would rather sit on the issues and stand on Jesus Christ. <laughs> he said, I've been preaching all over this country. And the fact that you don't know what I believe about these things is evidence that I just have simply let them alone. But I have preached Christ and I have baptized thousands of people into Christ. The third piece... The, the, this second piece, then, is a desire to be in a right relationship with all followers of Christ. That is a part of our heritage. That is a part of who we are. It's a part, you know, and I understand there's the ideal and there's the reality. I understand that. I understand that. And I'm expressing my ideal. I understand that. But it's there and it's breathtaking. And the third piece is the right relationship with all those who do not yet know or accept Christ. That might be called mission. Let me just read that quote from Barton Stone again. Just for your memorization and edification. The scriptures will never keep together in union and fellowship members not in the spirit of the scriptures, which spirit is love, peace, unity, forbearance, and cheerful obedience, reflecting the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5. This is the spirit of the great head of the body. I blush for my fellows who hold up the Bible as the bond of union yet make their opinions of it test of fellowship, who plead for union of all Christians yet refuse fellowship with such as dissent from their notions. Vain men, their zeal is not according to knowledge nor is their spirit that of Christ. There is a day not far ahead that will declare it. Such anti-sectarian sectarians are doing more mischief to the cause and advancement of truth you hear that phrase? To the cause and advancement of truth, the unity of Christians, and the salvation of the world. These anti-sectarian sectarians are doing more mischief to the cause of mission 
than all the skeptics in the world. In fact, he says, they create skeptics. Stone knew the passage, John 17. He talks about it more than once. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be in us. So that the world might believe that you have sent me. Apparently, Christ saw the unity of his followers as the single most powerful evidence to the world that he truly is from God. Several years ago, Gary Holloway, who's now the director of World Convention, and Bob Wetzel and I were on the committee that worked to, to get him in there. He's such a gift. Uh, he's from Churches of Christ, taught for many years at Lipscomb University, and he and I wrote a little history of Churches of Christ that, along with Dennis Helsebeck, retired from Milligan, and now Mark Toulouse, who was at Bright Divinity School, two other volumes have come out with sort of histories of the three major streams of this movement. By the way, I like the word stream better than branch. Streams are moving, and they can actually sometimes come close to each other and come back together. Branches are brittle. And you pull on them and they break off. It's just a different picture. In the last chapter, one of the things that we felt very strongly about, our movement, and we talked about some of these things and other things. Such a movement would be a missionary church. It would be the missionary church we always wanted to be. If we were going to be who we really are supposed to be. Missions and evangelism would not be merely a task for certain Christians, but would be at the heart of the church's identity. Mission is who we are. Evangelism is not recruiting people to our brand of Christianity, but proclaiming the reign of God over all. The good news of God's restoration and of his one body. In a sense, mission covers the whole thing. Alexander Campbell saw kind of a progression. It's, it's very interesting. His very optimistic view was that here in America, God prepared America. It's uh, unique in all the world. Nobody lived here before we got here. They didn't count the Native Americans. And, uh, and, and in this country, we can restore the ancient gospel and order of things. And once we have restored the ancient gospel and order of things, that will bring about the unity of all Christians, the freedom in America allows us to do this, the restoration, and that will bring about the unity of all Christians because certainly when they see this, everybody will say, everybody who has any sense will say, oh wow, why didn't we see that before, right? And they would all come together and the unity of all Christians would result in the conversion of the world and the conversion of the world would bring in the millennium, the thousand year reign of peace and prosperity on the earth. And for Campbell, at the end of the thousand years, Christ would actually come back. He's a post-millennial. It's a very optimistic view. But mission, in a sense, becomes sort of the overarching piece that's, that's all-encompassing for this. There's another handout that you should have received. I'm, I, I'm not sure what the title of it is. It, it's something about a 21st century restating. Is that it? A, re, a 21st century. I've changed the title a dozen times. Yeah, a 21st century restatement of the 13 propositions. Uh, later on, if you want to, take the old 19th century version and take my, my 21st century version, and uh, you'll see sometimes it's just merely an updating of language, but sometimes it's different. I, I wasn't just uh, saying exactly the same thing, but look at the second and third ones. Would you read the second and third ones just on your own silently?
What, what jumps out? What phrase or words jump out at you? Just shout them out. Mind of Christ. <clears throat> Acceptance. Acceptance. I heard a grunt. Was that a word? Oh, say it again. Oh, okay. Diverse. <laughs> okay. Losing their own preferences. Hmm. One's love for the for God and his people. Unity. You know, I think we just have to ask ourselves from time to time, and, and I've I've not done this for most of my life, but I have a whole lot more recently. What is the point of Christianity? I'm not making that, that's not a negative statement. I'm, I'm saying, what is the point? We all have a notion of what the point is. At least we act on it. We act as if we have an understanding of what the point is. It might be, and we all have mixed motives. I'm not trying to say that uh, we, we should idealize our own motives or understandings any more than what we talked about earlier, but when you really start trying to understand the point of Christianity and therefore the point of this wonderful movement within God's church that God has worked in for 200 years plus now, especially when you look at this notion of mission, it seems to me that the point, and you can say it in different ways, but the point seems to me to, me to, be, to be transformed and to be agents of transformation of others into the likeness of Christ. Is that trite? Is that not enough? It seems to me the hardest thing in the whole wide world. Because to me, it's just like what uh, someone pointed out. I guess it's at the end of the second one. To me, what it means to be transformed in the likeness of Christ, which is what 2 Corinthians chapter 3 toward the end is talking about, is that we're going to be like Christ in Philippians 2. And that means that he gave up all his rights and all his privileges and all his preferences and all of his pride and all of his true, uh, legitimate acquisition and power. He gave it all up for other people. His rights, his privileges, his preferences. I'll tell you what, that's not natural. That's not according to human nature, is it? I guess... I guess it's true, and I, and I certainly would uh, agree that uh, particularly Orthodox theologians have said, yes, this is the true human nature. The human nature that we experience now is debilitated for, to a certain degree, but the true human nature is that. It's what God intended us to be. But it certainly works against us now, doesn't it? I want my preferences. I want my preferences at every level all the way from what I eat to what we, kinds of song we sing at church to what kind of uh, people I sit next to. And I mean, all those things are just there and they're part of the flesh. And the transformation comes, I think, again, like Barton Stone said, in my paraphrase of Barton Stone, we must be in the scriptures constantly, not so that we master the scriptures, our intellectual abilities, but so that the scripture, the spirit of God masters us and transforms us into the likeness of Christ. And I think that's the point. And so I'll close with these things. Implications. You can and must have beliefs and commitments, but doctrine is not an end in itself. Sound or healthy doctrine is to transform us into the likeness of Christ. I believe that we should be able to tell what we believe, why we believe it, and what would be lost if we did not believe it. But we do it with humility, and we do it in a way... See, you see, this is part of the process of transformation. Struggling with understanding doctrine, I think, is part of the process that God uses with good hearts to transform us more into the likeness of Christ. We do this with humility. Have you ever heard the slippery slope argument? 
Well, you know, it may not be wrong in and of itself. But if we allow this, the next thing you know, it's the camel's nose in the tent is another version of the same kind of thing. Uh, you know, it, it, the next thing you know, we'll be allowing this and then this and we'll just be going down the edge. Of the, and before long, whew, the cliff, the slope is so slippery that we'll never be able to get back to the top. Do you know what the inherent flaw in the slippery slope argument is? It assumes we're already at the top. <laughs> Therefore, if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. This does not let us off the hook. It does not mean doctrine has commitment, has no importance. It makes no difference what you believe. That's not what it means at all. You can hold doctrinal positions and have practices without being exclusive in your attitude and the way you work with other Christians. I think this is another implication. You may have to discover what you can and cannot do together, but you do it in conversation with others, accepting them as Christ has accepted you. And I think there's a principle that has been around for quite a long time, but we haven't really practiced it. And you know, some of us are, oh yeah, yeah, we believe that there are Christians in other traditions, other places, but it doesn't make any difference in the way we live our Christian life. We still do all the stuff we do with our own folks. This principle is we should not do separately what conscious, conscience permits us to do together. Try that one out. And this doesn't have to be some massive program that you get a bunch of people together and for three years plan something and raise a half a million dollars. This is you and the guy down the street at the next church who meet together for coffee and start talking about what can our, our congregations do to help this community. And you may be as far apart doctrinally. And, and, and you know, if you don't see the face of Christ, as Campbell said in the other person, okay, all right? But the face of Christ is not that person agrees with you on everything. That's not equal to the face of Christ. The face of Christ is again described in Philippians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 5 with the fruit of the Spirit. Okay. You got seven minutes to ask me questions. <laughs> if you have questions. Some have been frowning at me. Some have been raising your eyebrows at me. Some have been smiling at me. All you smilers, ask me an easy question. <laughs> Not you, Doug. <laughs> about Campbell's post-millennialism. Of course, that died out post-wars. <laughs> um, toward the end of his life, mm. he backed off in terms of that, didn't he? I think that emotionally, psychologically, Campbell was absolutely devastated by the outbreak of the Civil War. You see, he was so convinced that America, the United States, had been the place planned, prepared by God to do this thing. The freedom that we had here would allow the restoration of the ancient uh, gospel and order of things and all that sequence of events that we talked about. Instead, Americans were blasting each other to pieces on the battlefield. Uh, there's a, an anguished article that he wrote after Fort Sumter. Uh, I did a presentation a couple of weeks ago at a, at a Church of Christ in San Antonio that had a bunch of folks in the military, but they wanted me to talk about uh, the Christian in Warfare in the Stone Campbell Movement, and I, I wish I had the full quote, but he's just, he has these all caps, anguished America. You know, God had had such great possibilities for you, and now you're, you're I, I wish I could quote the last phrase. It's, even before email, he shouted. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and uh, it, it just really and truly devastated him. Uh, the issue of slavery. You know, such an evil. And, and he, he could never bring himself 
to, to say, yes, this is an inherent evil, you know, because he was afraid it would affect the unity of, of our own movement and the unity of the nation. And it did. There's no question. Uh, even though Moses Laird said in 1866, we did not divide, he's not right. We didn't divide like the Presbyterians divided. We didn't divide like the Methodists divided because we didn't have the same kind of structures that they did. But we divided. And so, yes, his postmillennialism, in my opinion, pretty much vanished actually even before the outbreak. But by the time of Fort Sumter, it was, he was just devastated. Some people, well, the folks who, who uh, Talbert Fanning, many years later, uh, would say that uh, Campbell had gone senile when his son drowned while he was in uh, Europe. In the, uh, and so when he came back and accepted the presidency of the American Christian Missionary Society, he didn't know what he was doing. That's not true. That's not true. But I think he was so devastated psychologically by the Civil War that that went out the, went out the window. That optimism was gone by then. What else? Yes. I was wondering if you could uh, comment on some of the positive and negative aspects of the tension between uh, unity in our movement and independence in our movement. Um, you know, how our stru there is no structure to our movement. We're not a denomination. Yeah, well, of course, the, the term denomination, is, if it's used sociologically, then it just simply means a group of people who understand who they are. I mean, you, you, are, you are this and not that. You have a name that you go by. You have a shared history, a shared set of practices and beliefs at some level. Uh, and so you have an identity. And I think that the problem uh, is not being a denomination, the, the natural sociological process of uh, being with people that are like you, but the problem is when you do not relate to those beyond the group. So, uh, you know, the, the churches of Christ don't have any formal structures either. And there are pluses and minuses to that, right? Um, one of the things that I think is wonderful is that are you, are you a minister in a church or a youth minister or anything like that? Okay, you don't have to go to a group of bishops to get permission to go down the street and have coffee with the preacher at the Methodist church or to do a youth activity with the Baptist church group, uh, youth group. You don't have to do that. You may have to get permission from your local elders, and that may be just as difficult, okay? <laughs> but at least, at least this is a congregational decision. And uh, we've been, we, ACU has done some consulting with a, uh, a professor who's a Lutheran, and he's just astounded that we can be as... I mean, when we change our curriculum, we don't have to go to a judicatory of bishops to get permission and wait five years. The faculty meets and we change our curriculum if we think it meets the needs of our students. I mean, there are pluses and minuses. On the other hand, we don't have the kinds of support structures and we don't have the kinds of accountability structures sometimes. I mean, um, somebody can just show up and the movement has always faced this, and all non-structured movements have faced this since the time of the Didache. Uh, somebody shows up and says they're a minister. Well, I mean, you know, you can print an ordination certificate or a graduation certificate. Uh, there's, no, there's no level or higher level of accountability. Obviously, local congregations can and should and will uh, have some kind of processes. But there are pluses and minuses. The, uh, you know, in, in my experience, and this group may be reflective of that experience, and it may not be, there are a lot of folks who are part of Christian churches and churches of Christ who don't particularly like the label independent because it seems to imply that they don't do anything with anybody else. And when you use that terminology in the larger context of sociological work on American Christianity and you say independent Christian churches, nobody knows what that means. They think it's just some, some group that's they're Christian, but they're independent from everybody else, and so they're not, they don't have any recent, uh, except very recent history or heritage. So I don't know. I don't know what else to say about that. But there are tensions, there are pluses and minuses. I think the real key to this is that whatever we have as far as structure, formal, informal, or lack thereof, is to understand that we are not an island to ourselves, that we are part of something a whole lot larger than us, and we ought to reflect that. 
You see, Ephesians 4 has two things in it about the nature of the church. One thing says there's just one body. There is one body, folks, period, right? Is anybody going to deny that? Then if you do, I'll, let me see you later. <laughs> but it also says later on, maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. In other words, there's something we got to do. We don't create the unity. God created the unity already. We do not create it. And when we think we do, we get into trouble sometimes. But it is our responsibility to do something for that. And, I, you know, if this was the last thing on Christ's mind before he died, the unity of his followers, and he apparently thinks it's the most significant evidence of his divinity, then it ought to be a front burner issue for us and not a nice little thing off to the side or even something that we don't really want to feel, think about. Let's close with no, this. I'd like to say one thing. Yes. I've heard you several times now. You always ring the bell on this subject. You make me proud to be a Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I was proud to be a Doug as well because you were one. <laughs> Psalm 61. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. From the end of the earth, we call to you when our hearts are faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you are our refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let us abide in your tent forever. Find refuge under the shelter of your wings, for you, O God, have heard our vows. You have given us the heritage of those who fear your name. <coughs> Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for our Stone Campbell heritage with all of its devastating flaws and all its breathtaking sacrifices for others. May we grow in our love for you and what you're doing in this part of your church. Thank you for restoring us to a right relationship to you. Thank you for the one body of which you have made us part. Thank you for the mission we have of bringing your joy to others. In the blessed name of Christ, amen.